Welcome back to the Law School Toolbox podcast. Today, we're excited to have college and law school admissions consultant Sydney Montgomery here with us to talk all about law school admissions. Your Law School Toolbox host today is Allison Monahan, and typically I'm with Lee Burgess. We're here to demystify the law school and early legal career experience so that you'll be the best law student and lawyer you can be. Together, we're the co-creators of the Law School Toolbox, the Bar Exam Toolbox, and the career-related website, Career Dicta. I also run the Girl's Guide to Law School. If you enjoy the show, please leave a review or rating on your favorite listening app, and if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us. You can always reach us via the contact form on lawschooltoolbox.com, and we would love to hear from you. With that, let's get started. Welcome back to the Law School Toolbox podcast. Today, we're excited to have college and law school admissions consultant Sydney Montgomery here with us to talk all about law school admissions. Welcome, Sydney. Thank you. I'm so excited. Well, we're so excited to have you. Um, To get us started off, can you just give our listeners a little bit of your background so they have some context for where you're coming from? Absolutely. So um, I'm from Montgomery County, Maryland. I talk about Maryland a lot on my podcast, um, Break Into Law School, because it's one of the greatest states, I think, in the country. Um, I was born to two military parents. Um, My mom's a Jamaican immigrant. My parents both kind of got their degrees after the military. And, um, you know, growing up, I didn't always know exactly how I was going to navigate the higher education space. I knew that education was really important to, you know, my family, um, but my parents didn't go through the process traditionally. So it was all pretty confusing, but thankfully I had help from my high school teachers. I became the first student from my high school to go to Princeton. I had a lot of guidance from my pre-law advisor at Princeton, uh, shout out Lynn Zapsky, and, um, she helped me go to Harvard Law School. And in that process, though, even when I had just gotten into Princeton, um, you know, I reflected on the things that people told me. They told me that, oh, girls like you don't go to the Ivy League. They only take white students or they only take rich students or they only take 4.0 students. And I was none of those things. Um, but I didn't let that stop me from applying. But I kind of realized as I was at Harvard that there are so many students for whom uh, those messages do stop them from applying and from reaching their full academic potential. And so even though I was at law school, of course, to be a lawyer and I wanted to be a child advocate, which is what I was, I was a family law attorney for a little bit. I clerked for a judge and then I practiced law. Um, I, at the same time, started uh, learning as much as I could about admissions. I got my certificate in independent educational consulting from the University of California, Irvine. I joined the Independent Educational Consultants Association, the National Association for College Admission Counseling, I became a counselor of the year. I joined the um, ethics committee. I became the graduate school chair. And I tried to do as much as I could to make sure that I was giving quality and ethical advice um, because it was so important to me that I help other students break down barriers in their own education and their own journey. And ultimately, I ended up leaving the law um, fully to pivot into educational consulting full time. So this is my full time job. And we have a great team behind us here as well. Um, But I basically kind of dedicated my career to not just helping students through the college and law school admissions process, but also speaking up um, on equity issues as it relates to higher education in general, and especially, of course, in the law school process and in the legal field. Awesome. And if people want to find out more about you and about what you do, how can they do that? Absolutely. Well, you can always visit us on our website, smontgomeryconsulting.com. You can follow us at Consulting on Instagram or at Break Into Law School on Instagram. We have the Break Into Law School podcast. Um, New episodes come out every week. We have a YouTube channel. um, And, you know, we offer a myriad of things. We offer a lot of free guides. Uh, We have uh, some, you know, smaller digital courses, some uh, subscription plans, some, you know, small group boot camps, private consulting. But basically, no matter where you are in your journey or your financial journey, um, we want to be able to give you content that's going to help you be you know, the best lawyer you can and ultimately create generational wealth for you and your family. Nice. Now we'll say your website and your podcast are very useful. I checked those out uh, preparing for this podcast. So if you're into podcasts, go listen to this one. It looked like it was great. Um, Thank you. Yeah. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm curious. You <laughs> kind of alluded to this. We got this a lot, uh, particularly not so much now, but particularly when we were kind of starting out like, oh, do you do this full time? Do you get that a lot? I do. Um, I do get that a lot. It's, 
it's really great. You're like, yes, actually. <laughs> it's a whole job. It's a whole job. It's not, it's not a side, it's not a side gig. Um, you know, so I try to yeah. be good at what I do. <laughs> no, but you know, just be like, yes, we do do this full time. In fact, we have a whole team of people working for us and they rely on us for their income. So yes, yes we do. Some of them also do it full time. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Yeah, no, it's one of those where you're like, could you stop right now? Just stop talking. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, all right. So I know you work with a lot of first generation college and law students. And I think there's some unique challenges these students tend to face. Um, what do you think those challenges are and how can people sort of overcome those? Yeah, so I think that there's not enough attention paid to this population, and there's not enough understanding of what even defines this population. Um, You know, I had an interesting conversation with a prospective student and her mom the other day, and, you know, they're middle income, probably, they they seem, you know, um, and the student, though, she would be the first in her family to go to law school. And I was like, oh, you know, I work with a lot of students who are, you know, first gen to law school, and like she just looked at me like she never heard that phrase applied to her life. Hmm. Um, I think there's this misconception that all first gen students are low income or that all first gen students are black or brown. Um, but first gen, hmm. especially when you talk about law school, it, that's, that's a lot of people. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's a broad I mean, I think, category. I think technically I would have qualified for that, but I've never really you know, I hadn't, until this sort of became more of a thing, I never really thought about it. I actually just read a really interesting New Yorker article about this exact topic. So I think this is something that people have kind of mixed views on and like what, and maybe stereotypical views of what that means, but it seems like no, it's a very absolutely. wide range. It is a wide range. And, and depending on the definition that you use, I wouldn't have qualified as first gen to college. Um, and I didn't in, in college, I did not go to any of the first gen resources because I didn't think that I was first gen because my parents did get their degree, albeit through the military afterwards. Right. Um, but basically it's the, the concept that you are navigating a process that you don't have someone, uh, your parents mostly to guide you through. You are the first person to try to go through this process. You're the first person to embark on law school or college, Um, So all of the things also associated with being a college student and being a law school student uh, from dorms to juggling classes, to juggling working and classes, uh, to studying for exams, to knowing how to get a mentor, how to reach out to alumni. Like there's a whole host of things that if you are the first person to do that, you don't have that guidance. And so um, oftentimes it's not just the lack of knowledge that first-gen students have, but it's almost the lack of how much knowledge they don't have, right? You don't know what you don't know. And there were so many things I didn't even think to ask because I didn't I didn't know that I was supposed to be asking that question. Um, and, and even that knowledge of what questions to ask or who to ask can be such a challenge for those who are the first in their family to go to college and law school. And then I think there's also this uh, general feeling of, I don't belong here, um, or, or I, I can't do it, or, you know, there's something that happens with goal setting. And I've, I've personally experienced this recently I'm in, in the ed tech space now, and it's very new for me. Um, but you don't create big goals, or as big of goals as you could, if you are sometimes the first trailblazer in your family, or to do something, right? Um, and so, students that might have come from a long line of lawyers, they might confidently say that they want to clerk for the Supreme Court. And it seems like a reality because they've seen someone who's done that, right? <laughs> right. And of course, you just do that. I mean, of course, work? right? Oh, well, okay, Uncle Bobby, you know, he didn't clerk for the Supreme Court, but he clerked, you know, on, on the Seventh Circuit. So, okay, right. so he I can go like one step who, above. Yeah, he knows. So he went to school with someone who did clerk for the Supreme Court. I mean, I went to, you know, I'm sure you did too. Like I went to school now right. with people who clerked for the Supreme Court. It was like, totally normal. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. So then that's a goal that you can reasonably think through. However, if you don't have anyone in your family who's a lawyer, even saying, I want to work at a big law firm, like it seems like, well, I don't know. I'm I'm just out here like throwing smoke. Like maybe I need to just have more attainable goals. And that kind of um, dampening of your goals, that undermatching of your potential, I see it a lot with first gen students because even just going to college or going to law school is already, that's already their stretch dream 
for for most right. of them that anything like, more than that is just inconceivable. Yeah, I mean, Lee, my business partner, grew up with two parents who were lawyers. I mean, in the Central Valley in Fresno, but you know, like they were lawyers. She spent time in court, and she tells a story about her first semester of law school at Thanksgiving. She was home. And her mother says, well, you know, how are your, how's your studying going? And she says, oh, you know, I think it's going pretty well. And she's like, all right, let me quiz you on some tort stuff. And Lee was like, what? Like, oh, yeah, like I kind of, you know, negligence is sort of like this. She's like, no, you need to know these rules cold. And Lee had this moment where she was said, oh, my gosh, like, this is different than what I thought it was. But obviously, if your parent's not a lawyer, they're not telling right. you those things. No. <laughs> no, my, I stopped asking my parents for, like, homework help in, like, I don't know, the seventh grade. That was, right. like, it. My parents were literally, like, you're going to law school? Like, when did you apply to do that? You know? <laughs> right. Definitely exactly. Not, like, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, so, you know, I think a lot of it's just about getting the support. And I like what you're doing. So you're, you're really giving people the support they need and saying, look, you can do this, but you need some information. And that was really a large portion of why I started my first uh, website, too. It was kind of what I wish I had known or I wish someone had told me going into this. And I love the Girl's Guide to Law School. Just going to say, like, I was very excited when we connected because it was very helpful to me. Um <laughs> Yeah, I'm and, not sure I'd have named know. it that at this point, but like you know, it was it was of its era. <laughs> I listen. I was trying to figure out what to wear to things, and that was it was very it was very helpful. Um, but you know, I think mentorship is really important. It's uh, we have a student and alumni platform, so of course, you know, we act the counselors act as mentors, but um, we try to match all of our students up, our incoming one L students and our high school students up with a mentor near peer buddy, if you will, so that they also have someone that they can ask questions to outside of us. Oh, that's awesome. Um, I know you work with students throughout the entire law school admissions process. Where do you mm-hmm. see people running into the biggest problems consistently? <sighs> consistently, we see students running into issues, of course, with, I mean, there's two big camps, which are, of course, the big camps in the admissions. It's the LSAT and the essays. But I mean, from my standpoint, I would say that I see a lot of students discounting um, the importance of their essays. Um, and, and I say that, of course, the LSAT exam is, is a really big part of law school admissions. But I also know that it is not the only part of law school admissions. And I think it can be a process that really breaks people unintentionally. Um you know, it can be very demoralizing. It's very expensive to study for the LSAT. And uh, and sometimes I do see students not really investing in the right LSAT resources, kind of, you know, you, it's expensive, but I think it's one of those things that you have to invest in good prep because otherwise it will just be more expensive later. But I always tell students, you have to control what you can control in the process. And so the LSAT exam, you try as much as you, you know, you can. Um, but you have 100% control over your essays, right? And you have 100% control over when you apply to law school, hopefully in the fall um, or, you know, kind of December, January, but, you know, hopefully in that time frame, and, and maybe not as like March, April. Um, but students, they're, they spend all their time on the LSAT exam and then they're so burnt out and so tired and so overwhelmed by the time they get to their essays that they just sort of put everything there. Um, and, and sometimes, especially first gen minority students, they feel like they have to tell the most traumatic thing that's ever happened to them as an example of how they've overcome something. And I say, you know, trauma can be part of your story, but you are more than your trauma. Um, let's also talk about your strength. Let's also talk about what your goals are, your uh, the places that you've made impact. And, and so really putting that narrative together, controlling the story that you Tell admissions uh, is so important. And when I see students rushing through that or honestly just too tired and exhausted and beat down by the process to start really doing that deep introspective work, uh, it's a shame because then, you know, sometimes you end up with not a great LSAT score and also not great essays. And you should try to have one. (laughs) (laughs) Right. (laughs) You're going to need one of these to be strong if you're going to have a chance of getting in places. Um, Well, actually, that was one of the things I was going to ask you about. So let's just kind of jump into that to follow up a little bit. Um, Pretend scenario. I'm applying to law school soon, and I'm not sure what to write my personal statement about. How can I decide and how personal is too personal? So I love that question. Um, I say there's nothing that you can't write about, but it's all about how you write about it, right? So the, the topic of your personal statement, and I use that kind of lightly, 
um, should not be one that you agonize over. I, I think that at least here, how we do it is we have students do kind of a, a large universal brainstorm of just all the things that are um, important to them, all of the things that are meaningful, all of the moments in their life that have really shaped them and, and made them the person that they are. Um, and then also thinking about why they want to go to law school and what their goals are and and, and choosing stories um, in a way that links multiple um kind of points together, right? Uh, that it moves in time and space and uh, also has a narrative element to it because there's power in storytelling. Uh, it just evokes a different um, emotion from the admissions reader. It, it activates a different part of their brain. And so um, I don't think that there's like a thing you need to write your personal statement about, but it, it really should showcase in two pages, ideally double-spaced, uh, a couple of different uh, touch points and critical moments in your life that is leading you to this next juncture. Now, how personal is too personal? That in some respects depends on why you want to go to law school. There, I don't think that there's anything that's completely off limits, right? It, I, I have read um, and have had students that have successful essays about uh, domestic violence or sexual assault or child abuse. I mean, really heavy things. Um, but those are also not moments that you're going to describe in all of the detail, right? Um, there was a podcast, um, I think it was Navigating Admissions with Miriam and Christy, I think it was in their first season, uh, where they kind of said the more sensitive the topic, uh, the more delicate you write about it. Um, like there's this balance of tone, and I think that's really true. Um, I think with strong writing, you can kind of write about anything but it's 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 not going to be like please don't give me two pages describing that night right that would be hard right. like really hard to read yeah no and i definitely remember once not for law school but reading a friend's personal statement for something else and kind of going wow okay i never knew that you've done you've never talked about this to me and like this is i think this is it's it's too much <laughs> you know like yeah. you've got to back out of this like i'm not saying you can't have this essay but like this level of detail is a distraction, um, right? But you know, it's a it's a hard balance, I think, to get right. But I think that's great advice. Yeah, I mean, you don't you want to be thinking what is the emotion I'm leaving them with, and if if they feel like really sad, and and I mean, that's not the goal um, because they still need to be thinking, oh, this person's going to make a great addition to our class and a great lawyer, right? Um, so right, hopefully, exactly. you can kind of weave some strengths in there as well. Yeah, or that you know. At least you're you've kind of processed this, and it's something that you can move on from. Um, all right, well, let's completely shift gears on uh, off of the heavy topic um, to the money topic. Um, so I really want to go to law school, but it is so expensive. How can I get schools to give me money? And if they won't, how do I know when it's worth it to pay full price? The first thing I will say is that we're going to divorce ourselves from the dichotomy that um, either I get schools to give me money or I pay full price. I am going to posit you a third option. Apply for outside scholarships. It's not talked about often, but there are um, there are fundings uh, for students who are going to law school that do not come from the school itself. This is very important. Uh, this can be from a pipeline program. Um, this can be sometimes there's just general grad school scholarships that you can use towards law school. It's kind of like a pro tip. Um, but that will take some of the pressure off a little bit because on some level, you know, if your scores are below the median, like you're just, you're not going to get that scholarship from the school, but that doesn't mean that you then have to pay full price for it. Um, but how do you get schools to give you money? Let's say you are someone that is, you know, you're well within the medians. You want to make sure that you're applying early. There are some schools, not all schools, but there are definitely some schools that give scholarship money out on a rolling basis. And so, you know, for those schools, <laughs> applying early really does help you. Um, you want to make sure that you are really carefully looking at all of the um, different types of scholarships, the name scholarships. Some schools have scholarships for first gen students or for diverse candidates or for uh, students that come from other underrepresented backgrounds or for students that want to go into certain kinds of law. So and look broadly also at the university itself. There are some university wide fellowships that maybe you won't find on the law school site. Um, but again, that you can use for the graduate study at the law school. Um, when is it worth it to pay full price? I mean, almost never. 
Um, almost never really. Uh, but <laughs> <It's> <laughs> I mean, if they like, really, please if they take that to heart, z- almost never yeah. is it really worth uh, it. <laughs> like zero dollars and zero cents. They just, <laughs> I mean, I, don't, I haven't really seen, I mean, most schools, they might give you 10, which is basically nothing, but just nothing. Um, it's really just not worth it. I mean, unless here's a caveat. Let's say you get in. So you Harvard, Yale, Stanford, Columbia, Chicago, whatever. Um, you don't get any merit aid and your parents already have $250,000 sitting in a 529 for you. Well, that would sure. be nice. Right. I mean, I, I that, like, <laughs> all right, well, that's what the money's there for. So, <laughs> but, but if you're not in that situation, right, if, if, if money is like, if it's going to be loans, right, like it's worth it to pay full price, I suppose, if you have the cash, not in the loans, but if it's going to be loans, it's never worth it to pay full price. Yeah, the only exception I can see maybe or an argument for is if you're absolutely 100% certain you're going to do public interest work and you're going to school that has like a really solid loan mm-hmm. repayment system, maybe consider it, but you've got to be really sure at that point. Yeah, I would I would also agree with that, definitely. And and loan repayment assistance, very, well, let's say it's not the same as loan forgiveness. Right. <laughs> And it's that, not as guaranteed as they kind of make it sound going in either. You, definitely you want to investigate that option pretty thoroughly if you're going to consider it. Definitely, definitely. All right, well, let's move on. Um, I think I'm actually a pretty competitive applicant, but I'm not sure where I want to end up long term. How can I decide where to apply? And does it really matter that much where my school is located? So I think that there are two different kinds of schools. They're really like national law schools, like which I usually kind of call like T25, T30 and above and more regional schools. Um, and the regional schools can be absolutely fantastic. I'm not one of those people that, you know, I, I don't get caught up in rankings and, and the elitism like that, despite the schools that I have gone to. <laughs> but um those more national schools, basically what I mean is that they're going to have employers from all over the country coming um to the job fairs and it's it's going to be just you know easier if you you know if you go to school at a a top 14 or top 30 school and you want to go back home to Iowa it's like fine right um if you go to Drake and I love Drake um and I got to visit and it was fantastic and you're like well I really want to end up in New Mexico I mean like that's that's like harder you can do it (laughs) But <laughs> more of a challenge, definitely. You, right. There are, New Mexico is not coming to you. Um, right. so. And they might be kind of like, okay, so why do you want to be in New Mexico? And maybe you have a really great answer to that question, but you're going to need a pretty good answer to that question. You are going to need a really good answer to that question. Um, and so I think that if you're a pretty competitive applicant, you I always say you want to make a balanced list, You know, whether it's college or law school admissions, balanced list. So maybe you do have those top tier national schools and that gives you the flexibility if you're not sure where you want to go but I would say pick two or three cities or states I don't like cities actually I'm a suburb girl but pick two or three locations maybe it's where your family is um if you have a partner or like you know your best friend lives there that you're like yeah you know I kind of vibe I kind I could I wouldn't be mad if I had to spend three years there figuring out my next move and then put a couple regional schools from you know, those three areas or or whatever, maybe it's just one area. For me, I knew I was moving back home to Maryland. My baby sister is 17 and I wanted to be here for high school. So like, it really didn't matter where I was going to law school. I was moving back to Maryland. Um, And that's where my regional school list came from. Um, I think that would give you some balance. I think that's good advice. You don't want to kind of put all of your eggs in one basket. Um, And, you know, I think that that breakdown is absolutely right. Some schools you can go anywhere from them and the other ones like you probably want to be in the local market and they can produce great lawyers. They have great alumni network, but it's just going to make everything easier if you can kind of figure this out. All right. Next question. Um, It's been a while since I graduated from undergrad and I'm applying to law school and I'm not sure my professors are going to remember me well enough to write letters of recommendation that are really strong. What should I do? I love this question because I love letters of recommendation. Says no one ever, but here we are. Um, I actually have my students prepare what's kind of like a brag sheet, sort of like a recommender ask. It's actually very common in the college admission space. Like a lot of high schools require students to do this for their teachers, but for some reason hasn't trickled down to like common parlance in the law school admission space. But, you know, your, your letters of recommendation should really speak to your writing, 
your research, your critical thinking, analytical thinking abilities, right? And so I have my students prepare, I don't know, it's like a one pager roughly, um, maybe two pagers, but usually one pager that just kind of says, you know, hey, professor so-and-so, um, you know, these are the schools I'm applying to. This is when I need this letter. Um, you know, for background, I was a student here, here, and here. Uh, these are some moments, right? Um, like give them some anecdotes because the best letters have anecdotes, but, you know, tell them what law schools are looking for in letters of recommendation and then give them some examples. You know, I remember when I was in your office hours and we were debating, you know, this, this, and this, or I, I led that class discussion on this, or you really helped me through my thesis with this. And they will mostly remember you from that. And even if they don't, you have now given them great anecdotes so they can pretend to remember you. Um, but hopefully, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> the first step is to try to ask people that you really know. Um, and also, you know, if it's early enough, like if it's the, you know, right now it's like April, it could be May, right? And like, uh, if it's early enough, I would say have a virtual coffee, reconnect. Mm -hmm. And your reconnection, you may mention that you were thinking applying to law school this fall. And if they're worth their salt and they actually like you, they will probably say, oh my goodness, law school's so great. Well, you know, if you need a letter of recommendation, don't hesitate to ask me. And you'll be like, like oh, oh you know I what? thought of that. <laughs> Just didn't cross my mind. But now that you mention it, now that you mention, right? I will um, definitely put you on that potential list. Thank you. <laughs> look at that. And then you, you hit them with that, you know, thanks so much for the coffee the other day. I, I really do think a letter from you would be great. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to provide some information just to see, you know, if this would be helpful for you. I just am going to give you some some background and context for the ask and, and what law schools are looking for. Um, I always love that good one two punch of a, of a reconnection and then an ask. I understand that some students, it's like October and they're like, shoot, haven't asked. Uh, so you might not have that kind of time. Um, but you know, I still think that you should really try to give that information to them. They may use it. They may not. They may have their own memories. And that's great, actually. But at least you're giving them something to start with. So they're not staring at a piece of paper. Because even teachers that love you, and I've had my friends who are professors, they ask me, like, Sydney, I don't know what to, like, what are law schools looking for? What am I supposed to say? Or, you, you know, you just, your mind goes blank. And so help your teachers help you uh, get you into the school she wants. Yeah, and I recall some of them even asked me, like, what are you going to be writing your essay about? Or do you have a copy of that essay? So they could kind of tailor what they were saying. So again, it fits this narrative of like, what is my mm -hmm. story telling? You know, if they're saying one thing and I'm saying something totally different, like this is probably not, you know, what we're looking for, really. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, you know, professors generally love hearing from old students. Like, this is what they live for. If you're like, oh, you know, I really enjoyed that class and it was such an influence on me. And now years later, I've decided to like take this next step. And they're like, oh, wow, I influenced someone. Amazing. They yeah. will never be. In fact, they're just going to be happy. Like, probably someone's listening. And they're like, okay, but it was 10 years ago. Listen, they think that you have forgotten them. OK, so if you are like, hey, Professor so-and-so just went to give you a life update, had a baby, moved to Texas, got married. They'd be like, my God, my student, she cares. She remembers. Like, exactly. that's, that's what they're going to be like. They're going to be very happy. Yeah, exactly. Like if you say nice things and you remember them, that's pretty much why you go into education. I feel like I mean, I have students that I tutored like. 10 years ago and you know one of them emailed me the, the other day and I'm like oh my gosh it's so great to hear from you you should be on the podcast I'm always happy to hear from him um all right well we're getting low on time so I have a couple more questions for you um yeah I am at the end of the application process. I have just accepted an offer at a law school and I'm generally happy with it but the more I think about it I am just not sure this is a good idea when is too late to back out? And is there anything you think I should do to kind of figure this out over the summer? What if I'm making a huge mistake? So this is a definitely a, a tougher one. Um, I mean, the quick answer, is it too late to back out? I mean, it's it's never too late to back out, right? I mean, you should never say yes and put down a seat deposit and go to a school if you are not really sure um, that you want to do that. But I would actually say, I think you need to spend some time maybe talking with yourself, talking with a significant other, talking with a therapist, talking with your parents, whoever is in your support network, pastor, whoever, um, to kind of assess out if it's whether law school you're not sure about or whether the particular school you're not sure about and have as many data points as you want. Um, you know, you can sometimes ask schools to extend your deposit 
deadlines. So if you have a deposit deadline coming up, but you're not really sure, um, sometimes they can do that and you can try to get it more informational interviews. But if, if it's really like you've gone through the whole process and you've gotten accepted and, and you like the school, but now you're not sure if law school's for you, I would highly recommend, even though it's going to sound scary, um, you, you can see if you can defer, uh, but that's not always guaranteed. But I would highly recommend taking that time and listen to your guts because um, that's usually a sign that uh, maybe you weren't fully ready to go to law school and that's okay. There's other kinds of uh, graduate schools and there's lots of ways to make impact and sometimes students go to law school because they want to make change and being a lawyer seems like the way to make change but you can make change with public policy you can make change with education you can make change with so many different careers and so I would suggest look at uh, the motivations and reasons maybe read your personal statement why did you want to go to law school um, and then maybe it takes some time to look at some other careers around that like if you want to do child advocacy look at other ways you can affect um, children Explore those careers and then see if at the end of the day, you still come back to the law. It's uh, it's always worth it to take that time for yourself. Yeah, I think you definitely should not show up to orientation unless you are pretty certain this is the right time and the right thing. Because once that ball starts rolling, it does get a lot harder to stop it. And you know, if you decide to leave after you've started, it's a lot messier than if you just decide to defer for a year and try to figure this out. Yeah, I mean, a reapplicant, people reapply to law school, but starting and then withdrawing and then trying to apply later if you really do decide you want to go to law school is a much harder story to tell. Yeah, it makes it it's definitely a lot messier. So try to try to figure this out before you show up and actually commit. All right, uh, last question. I am currently on a wait list and I would love to go to this particular school. What can I do to try to get them to take me? So uh, it is waitlist season because uh, it's deposit deadline season. Um, they kind of go hand in hand. Definitely, if you haven't already, writing a letter of continued interest to the school. Um, and, and don't just make it generic with whatever's on their website, but actually getting some good insight. Talk to students. Talk to people there. Um, find out what communities you would want to join. Uh, follow the school's instructions. Every school has different waitlist instructions and not following the instructions are the quickest way to not get off the waitlist. And, and see if there are some things in your application that you can increase. Like maybe it does look like taking the LSAT again. It says no one wants to do that ever. I know, but that might be the thing standing between you and a yes. Um, or maybe, um, you know, I always say you want to have relationships with admissions. You want to start that as early as you can in the process. But if you haven't and now you're on the wait list, it's no time like the present. Uh, so try to get to know admissions if they have a forum for doing so, if they have info sessions or open Zoom hours. And sometimes they will be quite frank with you about what it is in your file that they are lacking. Sometimes they can't. Not every school has that ability or that bandwidth. Um, so you want to be respectful of that. But definitely try to do what you can um, to show that you are interested because a wait list is really about yield and they don't have time to accept students off the wait list that aren't going to come. Right. They definitely want to be sure that you're probably going to say yes if they give you a call and you're probably going to be excited about it and say yes quickly. Yes. <laughs> All right. Well, we are pretty much out of time here. Any final thoughts you'd like to share with people on anything related to the admissions process? Um, just to really trust yourself. I think that there. And to take some time for mindfulness, right? I, I think that there's a lot of stress and anxiety in this process, and um, it is a stressful process. But I think that there's ways that you can practice self-care throughout the process, and I really try to encourage that with our students. If it's the Headspace app, if it's prayer, if it's um, Insight Timer or cooking or um, watching a fun TV show after your LSAT studying, but just really try to take care of yourself because what you want to do is you want to go to law school as a whole happy person and you don't want to have been so burned out by this process that you're not really in the best place to start law school. Oh, that's great advice because this can be such a stressful process and it feels really judgy, you know, it feels really personal. Mm -hmm. um, and I think maintaining that kind of core sense of self and happiness, regardless of what your outcome is, is really so critical. Absolutely. Well, Sydney, thank you so much for joining us. And remind us, if people want to find out more about you and your work, how can they do that? Absolutely, yes. As I said, we're at S. Montgomery Consulting. We offer a wide range of options from just uh, free guides to 
uh, mini courses. We just launched our quick start essay plans. And so uh, they start as low as like $35 a month. Um, but then we also have our law school application boot camps, which are fantastic communities and cohorts of five students. And then, of course, we have private consulting. Um, so there's lots of different ways for you to get guidance and get help on your essays, but also on you know the entire process as a whole and to feel like you have a champion and a mentor in your corner so that you don't feel alone on the journey. Well, that sounds great. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been really informative. Yes, thank you so much. And I, I can't wait. I can't wait to continue to uh, to stay in touch with you guys and see how we can partner together. Definitely. That sounds great. Well, with that, we are unfortunately out of time. If you enjoyed this episode of the Law School Toolbox podcast, please take a second to leave a review and rating on your favorite listening app. We would really appreciate it. And be sure to subscribe so you don't miss anything. If you have any questions or comments, please don't hesitate to reach out to Lee or Allison at lee at lawschooltoolbox.com or allison at lawschooltoolbox.com. Or you can always contact us via our website contact form at lawschooltoolbox.com. Thanks for listening and we'll talk soon. Mm-hmm.